All right. <clears throat> well, thank you. Thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, I'm really pleased to introduce Sarah Perkey uh, to give our talk today on observe observations of the lower limb of the overturning circulation in the North Atlantic. Uh, Sarah started with a degree in mathematics and physics and then went on to the University of Washington to get a master's and PhD in physical oceanography. And that's actually where I got to know of Sarah because <clears throat> her advisor was Greg Johnson, who I was working with at the time on the IPCC. And they did some really outstanding work. Uh, Sarah in particular on understanding uh, the warming of the deep ocean and its contribution to sea level change and how it was changing with climate. And I was just chatting with Sarah and that that first paper she wrote with Greg in 2010 is technically her master's thesis and <laughs> it's probably one of the most highly cited master's thesis papers that I know of because it, it's it's definitely what consider a seminal work. Um, after that, she uh, did a postdoc at Lamont Doherty. And since 2017, she's been an assistant professor at Scripps uh, in the physical oceanography department. And so uh, I'll, that's, that's all I need to say. You know, she's a great scientist and a very energetic speaker. And uh, I look forward to seeing her presentation. OK, <laughs> thanks, um, Don, for that introduction. Um, and thank you all for coming to listen to my talk. I hope I can live up to those expectations via Zoom. Um, so OK, so I think I can start sharing my screen. Are people seeing the screen now? Looks good. OK, looks great. good. Thank you. Um, OK, so in this view, I can't see people or the, the chat, but um, please feel free um, to ask questions if I'm saying something that doesn't make any sense or if you have any questions. And I'll be happy to take questions at the end as well, but feel free to interrupt. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about um, a number of different kind of new observations that we have of the bottom limb of the meridional overturning circulation and the kinds of really cool science that we can do with it. Um, and I have mainly talking about work that my students and postdocs have done, and I'll, I'll kind of talk about who's done what as I go through here. But before I uh, start getting too far into the science and kind of what I'm going to talk about today, I wanted to get everybody on the same page about what I mean by the bottom limb of the meridional overturning circulation. And so this whole talk is really going to focus on the deep ocean and kind of what we can measure and what we know um, about about uh, the deep ocean. I mean, when, when I say deep ocean, I mean really deep ocean. So um, here are two schematics uh, that I like to start with. Both are from Tally 20. Uh, uh, 2013. Um, over on the left is kind of a, a beefed up glorified view of this idea of a conveyor belt um, that was put first forth by Wally Broker um, way back when. Um, but as you can see, it's much more complicated. And so we have this global picture and we have all these different colors which represent different densities of water and try to show the pathways and the connection between them. And so the reds and the purples are kind of surface waters. And then we see at certain locations, um, kind of here in the North Atlantic, that water is going to get denser and it's going to sink and it becomes that deep bottom limb of the meridional overturning circulation. And around Antarctica at a few locations, which aren't really well shown um, in this plot, but I kind of highlighted them here in four places we form the bottom limb. So this is where these, um, where Antarctic bottom water is formed. And we take kind of surface waters, make it really dense, mix with ambient waters, and we put it down all the way to the bottom. And this sits below this North Atlantic deep water. And it goes into the ACC and circles around and then fills really the bottom parts of all three major ocean basins. And this figure over on the right, I like because it kind of puts this in a three-dimensional uh, uh, view that you can see really well. 
And I also really like it because it puts Antarctic uh, at the middle. And when we think about the meridional overturning circulation, this is how I like to think and how I think oceanographers in general should think about the meridional overturning circulation because so much happens around Antarctica. And so the branch that I'm going to really focus on is this branch, this where we're forming this Antarctic bottom water. And so I want to start talking a little bit about the processes that go into forming that Antarctic bottom water. And so this water is primarily formed along the continental shelves of Antarctica. And so this is a schematic showing some of these processes. And so in this schematic, we have Antarctica over here on the left and then the Southern Ocean over here on the right. And in these particular locations, we have very specific geographical uh, features that allow us to produce this really, really, really dense shelf water. And so here uh, we have the continental show shelf shown in gray. These tend to be kind of 500 to 1,000 meters deep, so not super, super deep. And we have glacial ice, or these ice shelves kind of sitting out over them. And we get these catabatic winds that force the sea ice uh, to open up and you get exchange with the atmosphere, which cools the water and forms more sea ice. And as a result, you get this really salty, really cold water that sinks. It interacts with the glacial ice and you get this reservoir of very, very cold uh, water, very dense water sitting on the shelf that we call shelf water. And eventually it gets forced off the shelf and it flows down the continental slope and it's going to interact with the ambient waters that sit around and mix to form this water mass that we call Antarctic bottom water. And so again, this is going to happen at a few locations around Antarctica and it sinks down and it feeds into the Atlantic, the Indian and the Pacific along this kind of blue line at the bottom being shown moving to the north. And then as it moves and as it goes all along the bottom, as it moves to the north, um, it is going to slowly be mixed away. And this is a schematic um, from McKinnon et al. Uh, 2017 showing some of these processes that are important for getting energy into the ocean that is needed uh, to drive this diapickle mixing. And so what this is trying to show in this schematic is eventually uh, this Antarctic bond water is going to mix and turn into Pacific deep water in the Pacific as it flows back south towards Antarctica as a different water mass. And so what the schematic shows is kind of some of these main processes that you can keep in mind. Most of the energy comes in via storms and via tides. Um, and both of those processes, the tides as it slashes back and forth over uh, topographic features, can form internal waves and these internal waves eventually um, dissipate through breaking and that energy is what uh, causes uh, mixing between these different water masses and, and is what I'm kind of calling diapicable mixing here. Um, and the important features that you also see here is that there's all these places where these waves can get generated, but then these internal waves can travel really thousands of kilometers and that they are going to drive mixing not only in these places where it's interacting with topography, but also kind of throughout the abyssal ocean. And that this can happen all along the pathway. And so when you look at a transect, so this is now showing a transect in the Pacific Ocean going from Antarctica over here on the left all the way to the north um, over here on the right. And the black is the bottom bathymetry, and you see that there's a lot of features as we move along this pathway. And the colors here, depth versus latitude, um, is going to show what uh, the, the temperature um, of the water, uh, blue being colder and red being warmer. And what you can see is you start off with this really, really cold water, and as it moves to the north, it's going to mix heat down to the abyss, and that water is going to eventually warm. And so this is kind of a really fundamental feature of the meridional overturning circulation is when you think about a column of water at any given point, the temperature at the bottom is really going to be set by the balance between the renewal of this cold water coming from the bottom and the mixing of warm water from above. And, you know, this is really fundamental and kind of uh, people think about this as this uh, abyssal recipes or monk theory and coming from scripts is really hard to give a talk without talking about monk. Um, so I had to throw one slide up here just to kind of show this basic theory and it's going to kind of feed into what I'm going to talk about in terms of this abyssal heat budget. And so if I took that one column of water and thought about here, this temperature gradient going from warm to cold, um, I have cold water coming in from the bottom and I have heat coming in through mixing from above. And what's being shown here is what Monk really showed, which is a temperature profile, which is being shown in black here. 
could be very stratified where you have warm water on the top and cold water at the bottom with a very steep thermocline if there is no mixing or it could be very well mixed if you have very efficient mixing and the profile that we get or the temperature that we get at the bottom in any given um, location is going to be a balance between these two set by the rate of cold water coming in and the rate of heating from above and kind of when we think about the abyssal ocean partly because we are so data limited in the deep ocean we've always thought about this as being really in steady state at least on kind of long time scales and so that the deep ocean temperature was really set and that these processes were equal and opposite and so that evection plus mixing kind of equaled zero in that it would be constant in time and so one of the things um, that I've spent a lot of time looking at is how the deep ocean is changing. And one of the things that we've noticed is the deep ocean is actually not really in steady state and that we have this long term warming trend that we've seen in many of the deep regions that are fed by Antarctic bottom water along this kind of bottom limb of the meridional overturning circulation. And so this figure um, was from my 2010 um, master's dissertation, as, as Don just said. Um, working with Greg Johnson and what we did was we took all of the data that was available and that's shown in these black lines and we grouped it by deep basin which is this gray uh, lines and we looked at what the warming rate was and how that was changing between kind of over 30 decades between 1990s and 2000s and so this is to kind of update this work annually now to kind of keep a tab of how the deep ocean is changing and what's being shown is the watts in meters squared per second that needs to flex through that 4,000 meter isobaths in order to account for the warming we see below. And so red shows really strong warming and light uh, pink is kind of a little bit of warming and blue is places that we have, we have cooling. And all of these basins right here in the Southern Ocean that have a very high influence of Antarctic bottom water are warming the most, but we see this warming all along kind of this bottom limb of the meridional overturning circulation. And kind of the real kicker here is when you integrate this, um, you end up with something that's about 0.7 zeta joules per year, which is a significant portion of the kind of global ocean heat uptake or the global net uh, climate warming that we see. It's about 10%. So quite a lot of energy or excess heat is going into the deep ocean. And so it's important to understand kind of why, how it's getting there and what uh, the mechanisms are that are potentially changing um, that are driving this imbalance in the deep heat budget, allowing it to warm. Um, and so with that really brief introduction to what I mean by the, the bottom limb of the meridional overturning circulation, I, I kind of want to outline what I'm going to focus on um, for the remainder of this talk. Um, so I have kind of divided this into three uh, parts. I want to, in in and I'm going to primarily focus on parts one and two, and then I'm hopefully at the end going to have time just to highlight uh, this new CFC data product that that we've been working on with my postdoc Laura. Um, but for the for these first two parts, um, I, they are both kind of showing off these new technologies that we've been working on um, to increase our global observations of the deep ocean. And so the first one. Um, I'm going to talk about deep Argo and and some new floats that we have really close to Antarctica that are showing this kind of year to year variability in deep water production and properties that we can see now um, that we've never been able to see before with this new uh, with this new data set. And the second part is going to dive into an abyssal heat budget um, in the Southwest Pacific Basin and kind of the lessons that we've learned there. And that includes some direct measurements of um, ocean turbulence of diapical mixing uh, through through these kypods that we've been um, mounting on the ghost ship lines. OK, so for this first part, um, I'm going to talk about Deep Argo. So this um, project was led by George Thomas, who was a master student that worked with me uh, over the last year and a half. And he did some really excellent work uh, on these on on these new uh, on this really brand new data set, actually. Um, and so before I get into it, I want to talk a little bit about what Argo is, just in case anyone hasn't heard of it. So Argo is uh, this global array of profiling floats. This is a, a schematic in the middle that's being shown. They are typically these long cylindrical floats and they uh, go down to 1000 meters. They drift for about nine days, then they go down to 2000 meters and they take a vertical profile of temperature and salinity and pressure 
And when they get to the top, they communicate back uh, to us via Iridium satellite and basically send us a text message of that profile data. And there are close to 4,000 of these flows globally. Um, whether you know it or not, you interact with them daily because they really go into kind of your long-term weather forecasting. They help with hurricane predictions. They have really revolutionized the way that we monitor the upper 2,000 meters of the ocean. But the downside of them is because of their pressure casing, they can only go to 2,000 meters. And so over the last five years, we've been working on developing a new Argo float that can go all the way down to the bottom. And that's what's shown over here on the left. And so you can see it looks a little different. It's housed in a glass sphere, which is in this plastic casing. And um, in this new pressure housing, it can go all the way down to 6,000 meters. And so its mission, basically, it goes down to the bottom. It actually profiles on the way down. And then once it touches the bottom, and you can see here that there is a cable. And because these are buoyancy driven, once that cable touches the bottom, the effective mass of the float gets reduced and it stops going down. And it's smart enough to know, oh, I'm still changing my buoyancy and I should be sinking, but I'm not, so I must be at the bottom. And so all these floats get within two meters of the bottom and then they go back up a little higher so they're not resting on the bottom, so they're a little safer out of that bottom boundary layer and then they drift and then they do another profile 10, 10 days later. And so you can see on this side here is the CTD. This is a really highly accurate um, CTD that we've mounted that measures conductivity and temperature and pressure um, on these floats. And kind of the state of this program, um, we're really in the ramp up phase right now. This is showing uh, the location of all the debargo floats as of last month. Um, all of these green dots, which I apologize are a little hard to see, and these orange dots are kind of the U.S. contribution um, uh, through, or, or, or mostly this model of float, basically this SAO that, that's shown over here that goes down to 6,000 meters, either deployed by us or um, bought through our commercial par partners at MRV. Um, and then you also see a scattering of yellow and uh, blue floats, which are floats that go down to 4,000 meters. Um, and so for this project that uh, George Thomas worked on, he had kind of the first two years of data from these deployments uh, really close to the Antarctic shelf and, and all these floats kind of spent, spent some time under the ice, which is also pretty exciting. And so before we show that data, one of the reasons we're so interested in this region is because the deep water being produced uh, right off of the coast, right down here off of Antarctica, has shown a, a really high level of variability in terms of its bottom properties. And so this is uh, uh, showing some of um, the variability that we've seen over the last couple decades. And so this over here on the right um, is showing a zoomed in picture of the Ross ice shelf. Um, and so going back to the schematic that I started with, where I was talking about the end member that goes into uh, Ross Sea bottom water, Antarctic bottom water being this really cold, dense shelf water. This is where it's being produced, is on the Ross shelf. And uh, what a number of scientists have noticed is that over the last few decades, it's freshened a lot. And so this is a study by Jacob and Galevi from 2010, and this is showing shelf temperature or salinity data taken all over kind of in this uh, western part of the shelf. And purple here is showing older data from 1960 going kind of through the early 2000s. And you see that this, this kind of top to bottom freshening trend that's happened in that in all, all across that shelf. Um, and and uh, this is, you know, quite a bit of freshening. This is freshened by 0.3 PSU. This is a lot of freshening that's kind of happening all across the shelf. Um, and this is another study by Cassandro et al. in 2019, again, showing at a number of different locations, these different uh, colors correspond to these different boxes in this, in this top plot. And we see going through 2015, this general freshening trend um, that's going to affect the Antarctic bottom water. And we see it in the Antarctic bottom water. So now I've zoomed out a little bit. This is the Ross Shelf in the pathway of the Ross uh, shelf bottom water is going to come off the shelf and circulate into the Indian Ocean here. And so if we look at the kind of the southern end of this line, this is SR3 close to Antarctica, we can see that the bottom water has freshened quite a bit. And so I'm going to be showing a number of temperature and salinity plots. Um, if you're not used to looking at them, this is potential temperature over on the left. So warmer waters are higher, colder waters at the bottom, and this is salinity on the bottom. 
And if I if I extended this out, you would see a big TNS that kind of wrapped all the way around to a, a, a salinity maximum and then surface waters, which are fresher over here. And I've really just zoomed into kind of the bottom thousand meters of this TNS curve, which is being shown here. And the colors here are showing um, the the different occupations of this uh, this transect right here. Uh, going back in time. And so what I really want to show is just in in the 90s, it was much saltier at the bottom. And then moving into kind of the 2000s, even into 2018, it was very fresh. And so this is that transition of the end member of the Rossi bottom water is freshening, and so is the Antarctic bottom water. So we're getting this general freshening trend um, through time. And then going back to the shelf, in 2015, this water took kind of a very sudden change. And so the shelf water, which had been freshening over this long time period, suddenly got very salty again. Um, and there's a number of hypotheses about what was happening. This probably has to do with ice production and export and changes in the wind fields. Um, but regardless of the cause, we see the signature of a sudden and kind of this four year time period, a sudden rebound back to this really salty water that's being present on, on the shelf. And so what, what we wanted to do um, is to take a look at the Argo data um, in the region to see if we can't see the rebound of the salty water getting into the Indian. So again, the salty, we kind of starting in 2015, we had a really strong uh, salty signature of this bottom water that was our shelf water that was coming off, forming the bottom water and coming into this region uh, right here in purple. And so what's shown in the bottom here is um, uh, in purple is kind of a zoom in uh, of, of this region. And so these white lines coming through here are kind of the southern end of this SR3 line. And then this black line is the Antarctic shelf. Um, and this is the 500 meter isobath. And then the colors are, are the bit bottom bathymetry. So it kind of drops off the continental shelf into the abyssal plain here. And all of these uh, colored lines are the Argo floats that we had in the region um, deployed in 2018. And a few of them, so this blue one here and this uh, orange and light blue one here, came very close to this SR3 line and were actually deployed off of this line during the 2018 occupation. And what I've plotted on top of the, the, the TNS curve that I just talked about was is is the Argo data. And the first thing to notice is that when it's really close to the line over here on the left, it agrees very well with the ship based data, which is great to see. Um, but then as we move away from the deployment lines going into 2019, it's a little hard to see, but we start to see this tick very much at the bottom that the very that some of these floats uh, in this region are starting to get more salty at the bottom. And so we wanted to explore this more by kind of zooming out a bit and taking all the floats in the region and trying to see if we couldn't see this new Rossi bottom water, the salty signature, moving around Antarctica and getting into the Indian Ocean. And so over here, I've kind of zoomed out a little bit to talk a little bit more um, about the water masses that we see in this region. Um, and so in addition to the Rossi bottom water, we also have another site of bottom water being formed, which is the Delhi land bottom water, which is shown right here in this green dot. Um, and traditionally, if you look back to the 90s, the Antarctic, the sorry, the Adelie land bottom water was relatively fresh and the Ross Sea bottom water was relatively salty. When we move into kind of the early 2000s, the Ross Sea bottom water had gotten so fresh that it was actually much closer over here to the Delhi land bottom water. But post in 2018, um, when we're taking our sample, we see that the Ross Sea bottom water, which is the star over here, which is, this is, you know, a, a measure of the temperature and salinity of the water uh, after it's come off the shelf is again, really salty. And some of the floats, so this red float in particular is seeing this kind of Rossi bottom water, which is why we see this little tick. And some of these other floats are seeing it as well. So if we zoom in a little bit, um, and I will kind of try to simplify this into a, a water mass fraction here in a second, if you're not used to seeing TNS, but this was kind of the, um, the beginning of this analysis, uh, we can see that places where it's more salty, it just means it has a higher influence of that new Ross Sea bottom water um, that's coming around the curve. And so the ones furthest to the east have the biggest influence. You can see the Scion one 
as it moves, it has more or less of its water. And then by the time you get over here, uh, all the way to the west, we kind of have lost that signal. And so what George did was a very simple water mass analysis where basically um, you take the temperature and salinity, you say temperature, salinity, and mass are all conserved, and you can calculate the relative fraction at any given depth in latitude and longitude, uh, how much of that water at that given location came from these three water masses. And so basically what we're saying is that the water inside this triangle is a mix, and it has to be a relative fraction of, of this kind of warmer circumpolar deep water in these two uh, two varieties of Antarctic bottom water, Ross Sea bottom water and Adelie Land bottom water. And uh, it's a very simple uh, system of linear equations and you can solve for x1, x2, x3, where those are kind of that relative fraction. Um, and so what you get, so this is just showing an example of this float here, uh, the Scion greenish one uh, that, that moved nicely east to west. And what's being plotted, uh, the colors are latitude as it moves from east uh, sorry, from west in blue to east in, in, in yellow. Um, and what, as we would expect, it's about 30% of this kind of surface water, this or not surface water, but this uh, circumpolar deep water, which is kind of that salinity maximum in the region. Um, and it's higher higher in the water column, and it's, and it's really kind of zero. It's mostly these a mix of these two end members at the bottom. And then we can see the relative fraction of the Delhi land bottom water versus the Ross Sea bottom water. And so when you're all the way over in the east, it's primarily Ross Sea bottom water. And then as you move to, uh, sorry, yeah, as you move to the west, it's primarily Labrador Sea, or sorry, uh, 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 too many water masses, L A L B W, the Delhi land bottom water. Um, and maybe it's simpler to think about it just like this. So I'm going to end with kind of these two um, figures that show the relative fraction of Ross Sea bottom water um, as measured from the float, from all the floats. And this is showing kind of at, it could either do this along a density surface or along an isopycnal. This is showing the fraction of Ross Sea bottom water around this negative 0.4 degree isotherm. Um, and what you see is red is high concentrations and blue is basically none. And so at least at this snapshot of when we did this analysis with the Argo float, you see you get really good temporal or spatial coverage of the whole basin. And so this is showing kind of the end of 2019, early 2020, um, we can see that this high salinity, new Rossi bottom water has made it to the eastern side of the basin and is kind of sneaking in and then hasn't made it over here. And so the exciting part that we can do with the Argo data is now after these floats come up from this last uh, under wet winter season, we can do this again and we can do it again. And this kind of plume of very salty anomaly in this bottom water is going to kind of sneak up across this basin and it's going to interact with the other water masses there. And this will allow us to kind of think about how that water is circulating using that salinity as a signature as it moves across the basin um, and to really think about these kind of local dynamics that are going on. And so this is just showing the opposite. This is the um, Adelie land bottom water fraction. And again, you have low fractions over here and you have more water over there. And so um, I thought this was really exciting. I think, um, you know, a third of this data was actually under ice. Um, and so we have wintertime and summertime data kind of throughout the whole year to kind of look at this. Okay, so uh, I'm now going to kind of zoom out and think a little bit more about the heat budget in the Bessel Ocean um, and to kind of think a little bit more about this warming signal that we've been seeing and try to understand kind of what's driving it. Um, so right around the continent where we have really kind of year to year variability in what deep water is being ventilated and the properties there. Um, when we move a little bit to the north, you know, that water has now been mixed in the ACC quite a bit. Um, but we're really thinking about that kind of long term bottom limb of the meridional returning circulation. Um, and so for this heat budget, this was um, work that was uh, led by my graduate student, Ranashka Laley. Um, really in collaboration with um, a number of other collaborators, um, Jonathan Nash at OSU um, and Jen McKinnon being, being two of the main people. Um, so 
So this data capitalizes on a new data set of deep ocean mixing um, that we have from Jonathan Nash. And so uh, what is being shown here are a couple of recent GoShip transects. So these are all through the GoShip program. The GoShip program is um, kind of the, a hydrographic ocean program where we take ships out basically every decade and we drive along these sections and we take a whole bunch of different ocean properties. Um, including temperature and salinity, but also a lot of the chemistry um, and a little bit of biology. And basically, this is a rosette um, from one of those cruises. You can see there's a bunch of electronics at the bottom. We have these bottles for sampling. And what's unusual about this one and what's happened along each of these sections is we've mounted uh, what we're calling a kypod, which is basically a very a uh, fast sampling temperature sensor. And so we have these microstructure temperature sensors you can see here and here and one at the bottom. And what that's gonna allow us to do is um, get an estimate of, of what the mixing looks like um, if we can get out of the wake of the rosette, which was a little bit of the challenge. So we're gonna zoom in. Um, Renasco really worked on this P6 line, which is across this uh, Southwest Pacific Basin. And another reason why we were so excited to have this data here is this was a very uh, great basin to look at where we can also think about the tendency term in the heat budget. So that the non steady state uh, term of the warming that we're seeing in this basin. And so really quickly, this is again, so we had Antarctica down here. I was just talking a lot about the Ross Shelf and over here, these Argo floats, which are shown now as black lines over here in the Indian. The water, I think I put it, yeah, kind of comes out. It's going to circulate in the ACC and really enters this basin on its way north uh, to the North Pacific. This is um, Australia and New Zealand over here, but it's this nice big abyssal plain um, over here. And we have a bunch of ghost ship sections. What's shown over here on the right is just an estimate of that warming trend as measured from different occupations of this go, th these go ship um, sections. Um, uh, the blue lines here is the warming trend and kind of mill C per year estimated from the first and second occupation. Orange is from the second to third occupation and red is from the uh, second, sorry, the third to the fourth occupation. So a number of these have red lines, meaning that they've been occupied four times. And so if the warming rate was constant in time, we would expect all of these to be on top of each other. And what I'm trying to show here is that they kind of go a little bit sequentially between blue to orange to red, which means that that warming rate is actually accelerating in time. And this was further emphasized by the deep Argo floats again. So this is another basin where we've had a pilot array. All these black squiggles here are the position of a number of deep Argo floats that we've had over a three year time period. And this was a, a paper led by Greg Johnson. And he took all of that data and looked at the trend in temperature among those deep Argo floats. Uh, over just this three year period. And what you can see is that you have a warming trend. This is showing an example at 5,100 uh, decibars, um, but kind of throughout that deep 1,500 meters, we saw a really strong warming trend. And, and while this was a short period, it was about 30% higher than that long-term decadal trend. So again, indicating that this might be a region where we're having uh, continuous warming. Um, okay, so going into uh, Ratnashka's work, um, this is a zoom in version of the of the region where we tried to do this abyssal heat budget. Um, what's being we like this basin because it's fairly well constrained. Um, and so these two green lines are, are highlighting the fact that we have topography on either side of this deep basin. Um, so OK, so we've zoomed in. This is New Zealand over here. This is the uh, East Pacific rise in the middle of the Pacific. And uh, this is the 2000 meter isobath. And so it's showing that kind of those bottom three ish thousand meters, at least the east and west side, are really constrained by bathymetry. Um, and so we have no communication with the east and the west. And then we have this uh, P6 line to the south, and we have a hydrographic section in the Simone Passage to the north. And so the flow pattern here that we're thinking about for the abyssal ocean is uh, water coming. Um, from the south, primarily through this deep western boundary current and flying, flowing out through the Simone Passage. There's a little bit of water um, that goes around. We have two time series um, from moorings at different points in time that are coming through the Simone Passage that are going to tell us about transport exiting the basin. 
there's a little bit of kind of geostrophic estimates of warmer classes of water that flow around. Um, so this is not really no cold water comes out through through this is kind of the warmer water classes in our in our budget. And then across the southern end of this kind of northern basin that we're looking at, we have the P6 line, which has been occupied four times. And from that, we can kind of estimate, try to estimate what the geostrophic, from the geostrophic flow, what the net transport coming into the basin was. Um, and also along the section, we have the Kaipod microstructure temperature data where we're gonna use to try to estimate what the abyssal diapignal mixing looks like for our heat budget. And so to set this up, uh, the heat budget that we're going to use um, is going to have to make some assumptions, but we're going to kind of try to constrain it as much as possible. And so now what I've done is I've taken this full basin and I've kind of smushed it zonally to look at what um, kind of the properties from the south to the north might look like. And so again, um, this is kind of trying to show a zonal average. This is the bottom bathymetry. We have our P6 line at 32 south over here on the left. We have the Simone passage over here to the right. And we attempted to do um, a heat budget kind of along isopycnals. And I think this really confuses people. So I want to kind of explain what we mean when I'm going to show a bunch of plots along isopycnals for a heat budget. It's not really along isopycnals. It's along a box that curves following the climatological isopycnals. And so what we did was we took the 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 historical kind of a climatolo climatology of temperature in this basin, and we could define for each lat line a depth of where that isopycnal is. So this is just an example showing the isopycnal of 0 0.7 degrees C. Um, it it slopes, and so it is much higher in the water column, and then it gets deeper as we move to the north. And that's because we are mixing, um, and eventually it actually doesn't even, this particular isopycnal doesn't flow to the north. And so I can say, define a box, which is a set volume, right, um, for a heat budget, uh, based on the position of those isopycnals from the climatology. And then I can think about the heat budget inside this box. And so, Traditionally, when we think about heat, abyssal heat budgets, we have our inflow, any outflow if there is any. We have a little bit of geothermal heating, which is this, this yellow line that comes from any contact with the bottom. And then we have the diffusive heat, which is this Q-mix, which is kind of this vertical diffusion of heat that's coming from above, above that's really um, driven by the rate of diapignal mixing. In this particular budget, we also wanted to include the tendency term. So basically a term that had a time dependence of it. And in this term, we're going to have two parts of it. First, we kind of maybe what is you first think of, which is, OK, is there accumulation of heat inside this inside this box? But it, that kind of depends on the size of your box, because um, uh, it's kind of saying, what is the mean temperature? inside this region and how is it changing with time? So we quantify that, but we also, one of the things that we noticed is the biggest changes is the size of this box is changing in time. And so basically what that means is that if we increase mixing or we change something about it, the position of this say top isopycnal can, can move up and down in time. And there's an energy associated with that because if I take water that used to be 0 0.72 and I cool it or I warm it, I have to take the energy that it takes to take that much volume of water, warm it to a different temperature and bring it into this box. And so basically that's the second tendency term in this heat equation is basically has to do with the change of volume associated with, with each of these isopycnals. And we do this in a continuous sense. So we look at kind of the bottom um, box and think about the energy budget in there, heat that's gonna come out of the box above, there's gonna be an exchange of heat and then we do it sequentially kind of moving up um, each of these boxes and we look at each of these, I'm going to call them isopycnal layers, but they're kind of set regions that kind of follow those climatology iso iso uh, isotherms, um, which is being shown here. Um, and I was warned not to put equations up here, but I am throwing one equation really quickly up here, um, which is uh, sh from the paper and it kind of shows the mathematical expression for each of these terms and it's color coordinated here. So if you're interested, I'm happy to go through this, but we basically have uh, the 
energy, the heat flowing in, which is going to be kind of the difference between the temperature coming in and the mean temperature um, times and the density and the heat capacity of the water times that velocity field. And then we need the velocity field going out. Uh, and then we need to estimate the heat coming down. And then we also have to estimate kind of this change in, in the upper boundary, this D, Z, D, T term. And so I'm going to talk about how we estimate each of those, all of those components um, in this budget. Um, so first we have to estimate the horizontal mass transport coming in across P6, like I mentioned before. Um, we we are going to use the geostrophic flow. So the, what's being shown here is uh, the, the geostrophic velocity calculated um, from along this section. Uh, we did something somewhat complicated with the LADCP to try to reference uh, velocity uh, to get to get nicer looking absolute velocities. Um, and here red shows a strong northward flow, blue and the light colors show kind of a zero flow to a southward flow. And we see the signature uh, uh, kind of bottom intensified uh, western boundary current in all these cases over here on the bottom. Um, but, you know, it is noisy. But what we noticed is that when we integrate the transport below a given um, isopycnal kind of going from east to west, which is being shown here, uh, we can get kind of the net transport in each of these isotherm layers um, across the basin. And so this is just showing kind of the takeaway here. And sorry that I'm skipping over some of the details in, in, in for the sake of time um, to kind of get to the punchline. Um, but this is showing potential temperature versus mass transport in kilograms per second. And this is showing the transport for two P6 occupations. And so basically how you read this is uh, the amount of transport below 0 0.605 was kind of five kilograms per second times 10 to the ninth. Um, and, uh, and the blue line is in, is in two, uh, 1992 and the red line is in 2017. And so kind of when we get to the top of the one degree water, which is where we think of as kind of the top of the northward transporting Antarctic bottom water and the uh, extent of the budget that we're seeing, they really agree. And this is a scene in kind of all four sections is that the net amount of northward transport of Antarctic bottom water through that whole kind of bottom limb of the, the, the overturning circulation was pretty constant in time. But where we saw differences was we have less of this really cold water and more of this slightly warm water. And there's kind of reflecting the fact that we have warmer water kind of moving through the system. Um, and then moving to the north, we had, I said, a, some, a number of, of time series. This is from um, this Volta et al. 2016, who we collaborated with to get this time series to look at the different temperature classes in the transport going out. And that's now shown here in dash. This is the mean. Um, in 2017 in orange um, from that year and a half time mooring time series. And the blue was from a uh, WOS time series in the same location um, or roughly the same location in, in 1992. And still you see that change, which is the water's warmer, um, but we're still seeing that transport. And you notice that the warmest water going out is much uh, warmer than the cold water coming in because we're kind of have some of those ice pickles that lose. And then finally, kind of the last term we needed in here was this change in volume term, this purple kind of move, heaving up and down. And I think what people don't realize is that this is a very uh, prominent feature that we see throughout much of the ocean. And so what's shown here in the middle um, is the position of the isopycnals in 2017 and in 1992. So red, uh, you can see what we would expect uh, really is for those isopycnals to be roughly in the same place. And so when we look at kind of the 1.5 uh, to one degree water, kind of even to the 0.7 degree water, they are roughly at the same place. But kind of below this 0.7, it kind of falls off a cliff. And so where it used to be continuously stratified going down to the deep ocean in 1992, we see a much more homogeneous water mass. And, and this is due and this is really the warming signal that we've seen, um, and which is really kind of can be quantified as a drop in those isopycnals in the height. And so this is showing this DHDT in meters per year. And so we kind of see a 10 to 20 meter uh, deepening of a lot of those cold isopycnals and some of them just disappearing altogether. Um, in time when we look at the trend and and this is in meters per year and you might think oh that's not that much but you know we only occupy these every decade and so really 
this is divided by 10 years. And so we're seeing kind of a 200 meter difference in the height of those isopycnals um, between each of these occupations every 30 years. So it's like quite significant. Okay, and then so we can take those quantities once we have the transport and once we have um, the temperature, and we can quantify what each of those are in the heat budget, which is what's shown over here on the on the right. And the first thing to note is that while the unsteady state, this this time dependent term is important, it's still not dominant through most of the water columns. So this is showing from one degree C down to the coldest water. Orange is the sum of all those evected terms. So it's the water in, the water going out. Um, kind of the residual heat left in the basin between those differences with this very, very small component from geothermal heating. It's really, really small. Um, and you get this orange line. Um, and this primarily has to be balanced by diffusion of heat in this very traditional sense. We still have cold water coming in, heat coming from above. And we can calculate that as the residual, which is shown here in black. And we have included the unsteady term, and that's what's shown in purple. And through a lot of the water column, basically by the time the DHDT at 0.7 come back together, it's mostly zero. It's really only in these really cold water classes where it starts to become important. And so when we look at kind of below this 0.65 and those really cold waters in that bottom kind of thousand meters of the water column in this basin, it does end up being you know, a significant portion of this heat budget. Um, and so we can calculate this heat, this uh, diffusive term as a residual, which is being shown here in black, but we can also estimate it directly if we have epsilon, if we have estimates of what uh, the diapycnal mixing is. And so I mentioned this before, this is estimates from these chi pots, which are being contoured here along this section. Um, and what we have is um, uh, these very fast uh, FPO7 thermistors, and we can take that, if you're curious in the method of how we do that, it's really outlined in this in-review paper by Nash, um, and this Moan and Nash paper from 2009, where they where they did it on um, some, some other platforms besides the rosette, and kind of went through the mathematics of how you get from from basically 100 hertz temperature sensors to a plot like this. So this is showing estimate of epsilon. Um, uh, you could also do an estimate of kappa, and it's basically showing that you have elevated mixing along the bottom, which is these orange numbers, and then very low levels of mixing throughout most of the basin. And then some regions kind of in the interior, this is kind of where you have this deep um, thermocline, you actually have this elevated mixing estimates as well. So we can take that estimate and get a basin mean. And so this is showing the diffusive heat flux that serves as the heat budget estimated from that, those kappas in purple. Um, and we can also, I'm oh, sorry, estimated from, uh, the, from the chi pods in purple, and we can get an estimate of kappa of the diffusive um, constant here uh, in purple as well. And really the punchline here um, is, that the black line is from our residual, from our heat budget. The gray lines on either side is our error estimates based on our uncertainty in the inflow and the outflow across P6 and through the Smoan Passage. And then the purple line is from the chi pods. And then we also included on here some other parameterizations of mixing. So there's the strain in the VKE, um, which I didn't get a chance to talk about, but those are also up here too. And you know, it seems very noisy, but when you talk to the mixing community and you show this, this is actually very good agreement. I mean, oftentimes these are orders of magnitude off. And what we found is that for most, for almost all of the temperature classes that we looked at, they're green within their error bars and that we get very good agreement from both the budget calculation and the chi pods. And so this was kind of a proof of concept, but I, based on this, this it kind of seems worthwhile. It's pretty easy to put these chi pods on the ghost lines and they could offer a lot more deep ocean mixing data to kind of look at some of these processes. Um, and I was hoping to have a few more minutes to talk about CFCs. I'm kind of running out of time. So I just want to mention really quick that uh, I've been working uh, primarily, this is work being led by my postdoc, um, Laura Kamali, who is working with me and Jake Gebby, who's at Hui. Um, and we're trying to produce this kind of what we're calling this time-corrected CFC data set. And so, um, 
CFCs are kind of a really terrible anthropogenic um, chemical that's being dumped into the atmosphere. This is a sh this is a plot of the time variability of the atmospheric concentration with time, and as you can see, it varies in time. But they're a wonderful ocean tracer because they're totally inert. And so what that means is that if I go into the interior ocean and I measure CFC, say I go and I measure CFC um, 11 or 12 or SF60, so different varieties, um, at a given point, and it has a given concentration, say 300 parts per trillion, I can say that that water was last in contact with the atmosphere at that point in time. And so we can use this as an ocean tracer to say when, how long has that water been in the interior ocean? Where has it come from? And kind of how is it circulating in the globe? And these data have been collected through the GoShip program and we have a tremendous amount of the data. But one of the problems is they've collected over three decades. And so it's a little hard to compare because one data uh, sampled in 1990 is gonna be hard to compare to data in 2020 because of the atmospheric history and how it's kind of changed with time. And so what Laura um, has done is really developed a method. It's very similar to the GTD method, if you've heard about this, but to solve for these green functions, which basically tells you, I'm going to just skip to the next slide, tells us what kind of our, our uh, age of our water is, or the distribution of the age of the water is at a given time. And if you convolve that with the atmospheric history, it should tell you what the measured concentration of the, of, of the water is inside. And so what this is showing is just a demonstration of the method um, using synthetic data. Basically, we gave it a greens function, we calculated given the atmospheric history, what we would expect the CFC concentration to be, which is this blue line. And then we subsampled it at two points in time. We go back and try to reconstruct using this method for this greens function, which is this dotted line, and then use the dotted line to project back to what we would uh, guess that our predicted CFC concentration is. And the takeaway here is that this mostly works pretty well. If you have two points, it works fabulously. If you only have one point, it doesn't work great. But if you have multiple tracers, so say CFC 11, 12, and SF6, it, it works better. And so where this is going, and so this is just kind of like a final, uh oh, I'm not gonna be able to do this. Hold on, advertisement that I'm gonna just let this run. If I can do this, oh, there we go. So this is basically showing a section. This is A16 in the Atlantic. And where those kind of dots, and it, it kind of is hard to see, but where these circles appear is where we actually have data. Let me see if I can find one, um, like at this point. And so in this case, we have northern half data, but what's being filled in in the colors is this estimate of what the CFC is during all times. And so as I move this backwards and forwards, you can pick your favorite location and you can watch those color bars get progressively lighter from blue, having no CFCs, to um, more yellow, meaning having higher CFCs. And this is really showing the progression of the deep water into the ocean. And what we hope is that we can use this to really quantify the quantity, uh, the total amount of deep water being formed, but also look at this diapictal mixing because it's being ventilated along the bottom and then it's being mixed um, a lot uh, vertically across isopycnals through mixing and maybe we can use that for that and also just to look kind of globally at, at the circulation. Um, and I apologize that this last part was relatively fast, but I wanna leave a few minutes for questions. So my conclusions here, we're just, there's a lot of new technologies coming online um, that are giving us an ability to kind of look at the deep ocean in a really exciting way. Debargo being one of them. This is a, a, a figure by Johnson et al. 2015 saying what we hope the Debargo program will look like at some point. Um, we still have not secured funding and, and it's still really in the pilot phase, um, but, but this ideally we would have about 1,200 floats out there. And then also maybe this idea of, of monitoring deep mixing. And with that, I want to say thank you. And if you're interested in any of these papers, one is by... Um, by George Thomas, which is a, a GRL paper which just came out um, in December, and the other one, um, I'd be happy to take influence or input. It's it's currently in review um, from Marnashka. And with that, I can come off of this, I think, and, and take some questions. Great, thank you, Sarah. That that was an excellent talk. I really enjoyed that. <clears throat> so I, I will moderate the questions.
Uh, we typically will go to students first. Um, and so if any student has a question, just use the little raise your hand button and I will call on you. Um, give us a minute here. Don't see any questions yet. No questions from students? Okay, uh, Jordan. Jordan has a question. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was a great talk. Um, my question is about the, the first project there with that increasingly salty plume of water extending out from the Ross Sea. Uh, do you think you'd expect to see any changes in the volume transfer, the mass transport of the bottom water extending out through there, or just a change in the characteristics? So that's a great question. Um, and one they don't have an exact quantitative answer for you yet. Um, Unfortunately, the master program here at SIO is really fast, so they have 12 months to kind of do this analysis and get it out. And so we, we kind of had to pick and choose what we looked at. And that's something that I want to look at more. This long term freshening that we saw in, in the Ross Sea bottom water, we saw this really big reduction in the amount of deep water being formed. And it, it makes a little bit of intuitive sense if you think about it. Less salty water, fresher water is lighter. It's not going to maybe entrain as much or as deep um, in those gravity plumes to form Antarctic bottom water. And we saw that really throughout the Pacific Ocean and kind of the, 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 you know, the result of that was really a lot of warming because you have less cold water going into the deep ocean. And so the question now, if that theory holds, is that with the renewal of the salty water, did we see a lot more raw sea bottom water being produced over the last three years? And I don't have an answer to that yet. It is something that we should look at and really quantify, um, but ask me again in, in a year. And I think once we have a little more data, um, we can really kind of start to get at that signal. Um, but it's a good question. My hypothesis is that yes, we have a lot more water from the Rossi coming off over the last three years. And so we can see if that's right or not. Cool. Great. Thank you. Uh, any other student questions? Or then I'll just open it up to anybody. <clears throat> okay, I don't see any. Okay, we have one from Nancy now. Go ahead, Nancy. Ah, uh, you're muted, Nancy, still. <laughs> There always has to be one. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, thanks, Sarah. That was awesome. Uh, my question is also about the first part. Um, of course, I'm curious if any of those were BGC floats and if you had any, if you looked at those data at all. I'm going to go look, but. <laughs> yeah, so the floats that George was looking at were, none of them were BGC floats. They were just the TMS. And sadly, it's going to be kind of hard to put an oxygen sensor on our deep slow lows. Not impossible. We've been talking about this. In the deep community, there has been this really big push that all of the deep floats should have oxygen. Because one of the real questions that we're looking at is deep water ventilation. And oxygen is a great tracer. Um, and also, it's great for the biology. And it's also great for this water mass analysis. You can do so much more if you just have one more parameter in there. And, and for so. Children. And it's good for biology too. <laughs> um, so there is a push for that. We're not there yet. Almost all the deep floats or the 4,000 meter floats, the ones from France, the Arvors um, do have it, have the oxygen sensors, but uh, none of the deep solos unfortunately have it right now. But well, maybe I'm confused. I thought the floats that you were looking at for the first part were, I guess they weren't regular Argo floats. No, so these were all deep floats and I didn't really emphasize where we were, but we were kind of off the continental shelf. So we were in okay. 45 to 5,000 meters of water. The bottom kind of ranges from 4,500 to 6,000 meters there. So we're in really deep water. Um, so core Argo is not gonna help us. There has been some studies looking at some of the core Argos that have kind of accidentally ended up on the shelf um, or purposely ended up on the shelf um, and those are interesting and, and it would be interesting to look at some of them, but that was much shallower. I was, this was mostly in the deep ocean. Cool. Thank you. 
Right. Uh, next question is from Jessica. Okay, uh, looks like she's gone now, so I guess it's Boris. All right, uh, very interesting, Simon. Mm -hmm. uh, now, since you talked about turbulence and I uh, know more about turbulence, I have a couple of questions to you. First of all, uh, you go close to the bottom and uh, uh, turbulence is not always very strong, so uh, you may encounter some effects from double diffusion processes. Did you notice any role of them being played or north or south? You know, so we didn't look at that. Um, that would be a good thing to look at. We could probably do that with the CDD data. Um, this region, the TNS is super tight, is mostly just, just because of the dynamics of the sink. So in this particular basin where you have, you have kind of a sill. And so the temperature of water that's coming in really flows over the sill and you kind of get that homogeneous bottom layer that's relatively thick and you have very, very low stratification. Um, and it's just getting more homogeneous for reasons that are kind of interesting to think about. But yeah, I think, you know, I'd love to talk to you more about this. I think we're kind of using estimates of mixing um, from other people and trying to put it together and compare it to our inferred estimates from the heat budget. Um, but there's so many nuances in trying to measure deep ocean mixing um, that it's it's challenging. I mean, there's a reason why we don't have that much data. Um, and I think it will take, but it's an important thing. So I think the more people thinking about it and kind of how to actually do that is important. Let's just try to quantify it. If you calculate the buoyancy Reynolds number, which is epsilon divided by new molecular viscosity n square, if this number is small, the order of one, then turbulence is weak and we will see double diffusion. Did you try to estimate it? No. Yeah, I don't think we got to that, but it would be interesting to, to think about how to do that. And another question I had, was if you saw uh, the compensating effect of density and salinity, uh, um, temperature and salinity in, in what you did, because usually it's a very important thing. Um, as far as just like when the, so can you rephrase that? Well, they act in such a way that the density gradient is small, even so you can have big gradients of temperature and salinity. Um, yes, so. Well, so for this budget, when we're thinking about the heat budget, we kind of defined it still needed to be in a finite volume mostly. So we kind of defined it on a position. That kind of well, it's not, not well, it's probably more <clears throat> involved questions, so I shall leave it where, where it is, but I can talk to you later about it. Yeah, I think I, yeah, okay, we should chat offline. Um, I'm not sure I completely understand the question. All right, uh, let's move on to our, our, our next question then, since Boris has already had two. Uh, this will be uh, Bob Weisberg. Well, hi, Sarah. That was a very nice talk. I appreciate your, your visit here with us. Um, I found particularly interesting in the beginning the variation in salinity with the, the bottom water. Um, so is there some way of correlating, say, what the salinity should be with the formation of new bottom water and the time series of sea ice formation around the Antarctic. Yeah, so I think I showed this uh, one paper. There's a second paper uh, that was a really nice paper that looked more at this recovery. I mean, we've been seeing this long-term freshening and there hasn't 
been a ton of work. There was a little bit of hypothesis by Dan Jacobs that really that it was freshening due to an influx of glacial melt ice that was coming. Um, and he showed this using the O18 data that you also have a, a signature of kind of more glacial ice in the region. And then the sudden recovery, you know, they really looked at some reanalysis data with winds and made some assumptions about sea ice and sea ice production and export. And so it kind of came down to, you know, but I don't think they went through the process of really doing a budget. Um, the only paper that I know that kind of, yeah, not on the shelf. I mean, people have kind of thought about those, the salt budgets and, and really the sea ice is such a huge component of that. It really dominates. Um, and so I think the kind of understanding or, or the prevailing theory is that you can, you know, in, in the sea ice production is going to be dominated by wind. So if you have small changes in the wind field, um, you can really change the salinity budget on the shelves. Um, but it's an interesting open question. And it's, again, it's one of these regions like the deep ocean that we're just extremely data limited. And so it it's, um, it's a great, it's a great question to think about. You know, can well, we the, reason I, the reason I raised that is that when you have just a few um, samples of something, it's hard to start fitting trends. But if you somehow can relate that to something that has a longer record, like, like the sea ice, you might, you know, be able to get a little more confidence in your your trend fitting. But the other, you know, quick question I had is, you know, I've done a lot of heat budget work and when you have to rely on a residual, you know, it becomes it, it becomes really kind of difficult. And so you mentioned that you got well, you got the the local rate of change with time as a residual. And can you estimate the errors and the things that you're making that residual from? So that I kind of skipped over that part. We have really large error bars in that residual calculation, which was that gray shading. And we, so, you know, and that mainly comes in a lot of ways from the mooring data through the Simone passage where it's relatively confined. We know that relatively well, and we know what the variance is and therefore we can beat down our statistics. The problem with the using this kind of geostrophic uh, geostrophic velocities to estimate transport is it's a moment in time and those are all in the same season and so what we did to get the error bars is there's a really back from Wos error there was a deep mooring that lasted for about 12 months across across the deep western boundary current so we took the variance seen in that and then we took some of the deep Argo floats while they were close enough to that P6 line to look at what the variation in the geostrophic transport was across the abyssal plane. And then we just kind of tried to add those numbers together. And, you know, there's a huge amount of seasonal cycle. There's a huge amount of just variations from month to month in, in the deep western boundary current. And so, you know, I think you know, thinking about the error, I mean, it was it was complicated to think about the error budget, and we did end up leaving it rather big um, because we didn't want to kind of overstate. You know, it, there is a lot of variability. We noticed in the deep western boundary current, and you see in the mooring, but a lot of that is recirculation. And so if you are integrating across the whole thing, your net transport might not have as much variability as you see in the geostrophic flow. Um, but yeah, it's, we need deep Argo everywhere and deep Argo is not, we deploy them in the deep western boundary current, they don't stay in the deep western boundary current, so it doesn't really work, same as any boundary current that's fast flowing. And so we need kind of solutions to that part of the observing system and and it might be moorings, it might be deep gliders or um, all good questions. Um, all right, well, thank you. It was uh, yeah. a very nice talk. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, I, I, I'm going to uh, play my host hat and uh, ask a uh, final question here before we <clears throat> thank you. Uh, and it's about the uh, temperature changes over the deep Argo period in that one basin. You know, you got a three-year trend that was a little bit higher, significantly higher than the longer-term trend. And so, yeah, technically that is an acceleration. And you know, one interpretation is that it is a accelerating uh, 
heat stored in that area. But it could also just be an interannual variation. So have you thought about if it is an interannual variation, how that might affect your longer term estimates of the trends since you're only using single points if the interannual variability is a lot larger than you assumed? Right. So we assumed a linear. So <clears throat> we is, the warming trend that we basically used was a linear trend. And so by all accounts, that should be the most conservative. And so if it was faster in later times, um, and the budget for the most part that we were looking at was trying to center around 2017. So if it's actually faster in 2017 than it was over the 30 year period that we're looking at, then that purple line should be relatively bigger. Um, but you know, it's sometimes easier to be more conservative when you're kind of doing something new than less conservative. So that's kind of what we went with. But yeah, yeah. So I mean, the, the, it could be. I do the deep Argo, um, looking, trying to get kind of a, a trend over three years is is tricky, right? I mean, it, it, there could be any number of things at play. You could have even, I mean, Natalie Zilberman has a nice paper looking at kind of the seasonal cycle of the geostrophic flow down there from the Argo floats. And so you could be aliasing a whole number of things that were not really super well considered in that paper. So that I think we need more data. I think when we have five or 10 years of deep Argo data, we can start to look at, you know, is it linear? Is it not linear? Is there oscillations? What are we looking at here? And, and that's why we just need more data. Yeah. All right, that I I agree. The more data, the better. So let's hope we can get some more deep Argo. Uh, well, with that, I think it's time to thank our speaker. And uh, so, if you could unmute your microphones and uh, join me in a round of applause. Thank you very much. So so. Uh,